I'd like to ask you if, now, if you will, to take your Bibles. Join me in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We'll look at two verses this morning, verse 12 and verse 13. When you find 1 Thessalonians 5, 12, if you would, out of respect and reverence to the reading of God's Word, let's all stand together as we read this. Paul writes to this church there in Thessalonica as he's closing this letter and he says, But we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give instruction, and that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, as we approach your text this morning, it is once again with Father, need that we come to you praying for the ministry of the Holy Spirit who takes your word and plants it upon our hearts, takes your word and puts it upon our minds, gives us clarity of thought and clarity of understanding. And so we pray that the Holy Spirit would work that way in our hearts and minds this morning. Father, we pray that the Holy Spirit would also take this passage and, Father, help us as a church to apply it. Uh, Father, we pray that um, we would be an example to other churches around us uh, of pastor and congregation, of the relationship between the two. And so we pray that, uh, Father, this is just more than words on the page to us, more than just facts that we, we store away in our minds. But Father, these, these would be truths that we would live out so that we can continue to be better witnesses for you. We ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. I want to start this morning with a question. A question, what on earth is Christ doing? Maybe I should rephrase it a little bit so that it doesn't sound so, um, <laughs> so alarming, so, so concerning. Instead of saying, what on earth is Christ doing, maybe we should say, what is Christ doing on earth? What is it he is trying to accomplish? Trying. He's not trying, I can guarantee you that. What is it he is accomplishing on earth? Uh, that, that, that is what, the way it should be stated. What is Christ's objective on earth today? That's a question that um, if you watch people and you listen to people, uh, you might come up with all kind of different answers. You might conclude from the way they talk, the, way, the things that they do, you might conclude all kind of different answers. If, uh, if you watch sports, if you watch any kind of level of athletics, um, professional, college, it, doesn't, it could be baseball, it could be football, basketball. Uh, you'd probably come to the conclusion that Christ is building a championship team. Uh, that's what he's doing. He's putting together a group of men who can bring a championship to this school or this city. You might conclude that Christ is working through an individual to enable him to achieve individual goals, to win a specific award that is given to an individual. Look, all you got to do is watch post-game interviews. That's what God is doing. It's what you to conclude anyway by listening to them. Listen to some political individuals, and you would be led to believe that Christ is building a political party. He's got this one man that he, if, if God can work it out in some way and put him in office, that all the ills of that nation will be answered. God is working to redeem a nation or bring a nation under his rule and reign. Hmm. There are those in the prosperity gospel. You ever listen to some of those people talk? If you were li listen to them, you would think that God is bringing the, the angels of dominion, uh, 
and the four angels of the winds and all these other things that they dream up and they're bringing about for your prosperity and for your well-being. You listen to some well-meaning Christians, some well-meaning pastors, and you would conclude that God is working to bring about good in your life. I didn't say he's bringing about your life for good. I said bring about good in your life. Paul would have liked that, wouldn't he? Paul would like for God to have brought about good in his life. I mean, just read about it. The poor man endured a lot. You would think by listening to some that what God is doing is building your career, helping you climb the corporate ladder. He's helping you build a better home, a better marriage. You'd conclude that that is the goal of Christ on earth. The Bible gives us some insight of what Christ is doing on earth, though. The Bible gives us a good indication of what God is doing, what Christ is doing right now on earth. In Matthew's Gospel... Jesus has gotten away with his disciples. And this, is a, this is a point we're coming to pretty quickly in our Sunday night study of, of the life of Christ. Uh, but in, in Matthew's gospel, he has reached the, the place of Caesarea Philippi. And he's gotten alone with his disciples there, and he asked them a question. Who do men say that I am? And the, the disciples answered him, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say Jeremiah, others say you're one of the prophets. And Jesus asked them, who do you say that I am? And Peter, Peter answers and says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Christ confirms Peter's answer. And he says, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So uh, Christ is telling Peter, you're right. That is who I am. I am the Christ. I am the Messiah. I am the Son of God. That's the right answer. Then we read Christ's words when he says, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and... Then he says, I also say to you that you are Peter. And upon this rock, this confession, that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. What's Christ doing? Christ is building his church. That did not stop on the cross. He did not build the church on the cross and then say, okay, it's done. When he said it is finished, that's not what he was getting at. He wasn't saying the church is complete. In fact, if you'll look with me, look, look at Acts chapter 1. First line in Acts. Luke writes here and he says, The first account, Acts chapter 1, verse 1, The first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus, notice that next word, began to do and teach until the day he was taken up. Um, the work wasn't done when he ascended into heaven. He did not stop building the church when he ascended into heaven. He was still building the church then, and he is still building the church today. Now, there are, there are a lot of things that, that fall under the umbrella of building the church. 
a lot of things that he's doing while building the church. Hebrews 1.3 says he's upholding all things by the word of his power. That means that this word, world just keeps going because of his power. The sun keeps rising, the moon keeps rising, the stars stay where they are, the rain continues to come, the, the oceans stay in the ocean and not in inland, the mountains stand, the trees grow, the grass grows because of what he's doing. Romans 8, 34 says that Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, he who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who's the us there? The church. He is interceding on behalf of the church. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, the, what we look at is the Great Commission. He says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus is protecting. He is using his disciples. He's protecting his disciples. Uh, that's when, it, when he says, all authority has been given to me. He is, he is protecting them. He is using them. He is overcoming our own sinful passions. He's overcoming the own the sinful nature of those who we are witnessing to. He is using his disciples to make new disciples. The work that Christ is about doing right now, right here on earth, is building the church. What's he using to build the church? The church. That's his tool as well. He is using the church to build the church. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12 to, uh, 11 to, For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, jealousy, for I betroth you to one husband, so that to Christ I might present to you, present you as a pure virgin. The bride of Christ is the church. And so Christ is using the church to build the church. He is drawing people to salvation. And then once he brings people to salvation, he is sanctifying them and then he is using them to bring others to salvation. He's using them as his mouthpiece, as his workers to bring others into the church. The work that Christ is doing right now is building the church. That's where our text comes in this morning. Paul is focusing right here in these two verses on what might be the second most important relationship in the church. Our first most important relationship is with him. And I say might because it might not be, but it, it, this is a vital, this is an extremely important relationship. It is a relationship that is so important to the church because the world sees it. It has a great deal of impact on the success or failure of the church, the growth or the decline in the church. It has a great deal of impact on the spiritual growth of the people in the church or the stagnation of the people in the church. The relationship he's focusing on here is the relationship between the congregation, the people that make up the body of Christ, the body that make up the local church, and those who have been called to lead that local body, the pastors or the elders. When you observe that relationship in a, in a local church, you can tell a lot about the church. You can tell whether it's healthy or not. You can tell whether it's got good growth to it or whether it's just adding numbers. There is a difference. It 
it's curious to me where I started this by talking about what Christ is doing building the church. There are a lot of uh, church growth models. There are a lot of people proposing this is how you grow a church. You want to grow a church by doing this. You change the music or you do away with music. You do away with pulpits or you add this, you add that. But even, even what appears to be good and sound church growth models never focus on this aspect of the life of the church. They never say anything about the relationship between the pastor and the congregation. That is key to church growth. You can add numbers in it. A, a, a pastor can draw a following. There can be people come in because of the pastor. He can be charismatic enough or he can be likable enough that people come in to the church because of him. That's not church growth. A church can grow because a certain family, a certain group of people in the church are so well liked and, and so influential in the neighborhood, neighborhood that they can get people to come into the church. They can join the church in the numbers and the, uh, on the roll can change, but that is not necessarily church growth. And you can tell that when something happens with the pastor. If the pastor leaves and, and a lot of the people leave, it wasn't for Christ that they were coming. It's probably for the pastor. If it is grown because of clicks in the church and something happens, you have a split and a lot of people leave, you can tell they weren't here for the church. They weren't here for Christ. They were here for a group of people. There is a difference between numerical growth and church growth. Church growth is when people come for Christ. Numerical growth could be for a number of reasons. And just because a church is growing in numbers does not indicate health in the church. An indicator of health in the church, one indicator, there, there are several, but an indicator of health in the church is the relationship between the pastors and the congregation. How those two get along. Sadly, in most churches, I, I, I follow a lot of pastors on different social media platforms. I get a lot of emails. I'm, I'm listening to various different things. Um, for the most part, this relationship in the church in the United States is not good. It's not good. There, there are some churches where you do find a good relationship between the pastor and the congregation, but those are few and far between. And there's plenty of blame to go around, and plenty, of, plenty of blame on both sides, not just the pew, it's also in the pulpit. You have a lot of pastors who are looking at a pastorate as a career. And uh, this is a corporate ladder type thing. They use this church to find a bigger church, and then they'll use that one to find a bigger church. And there are a lot of pastors that um, have two-year plans or five-year plans. They're a lot like Jimmy Johnson, the famed football coach for the Miami Hurricanes and Dallas Cowboys. In an interview after winning their second Super Bowl with the Dallas Cowboys, shortly after that, he left the Cowboys. He was no longer there. And in, in an interview with him at that time, they asked what happened, and he made the statement and said, I've never stayed in one place more than five years. When you look at his career, five years was the limit. He never stayed in one place more than five years. And when he was in Miami, at the University of Miami, and when he was in Dallas, they were a powerhouse. And he left at the height both times. You have some pastors that have a two-year plan or a five-year plan. Most of them, their plan works like this. They have a stack of sermons. And that sermon will get them to, through two years or three years or four years or five years. And when they start getting to the bottom of that stack, they start looking for another church so that they can go back through the stack again. 
They're just constantly moving. Now, that's not the congregation's fault. That's the pulpit's fault. On the other side, you have family power struggles. You have history and tradition that gets upset. You have some that are simply unwilling to learn. They're unwilling to address and change in areas in, in the life of the church that must change. You've got the attitude, well, he's not our old pastor. He's not, he's not the guy that was here before. They don't like his style. They don't like various things about him. There seems to be a, this attitude that you know, there, there are many pastors out there. We'll just keep searching through until we find the one, right? There seems to be this shared belief on both sides of the pulpit, whether it's in the pew or behind the pulpit, that things are always going to be, if it's the right pastor, things are always going to be good. There's never going to be strife. There's never going to be difficulty. There's never going to be disagreement between the pew and the pulpit. We're always going to get along. And though, so, since that's the belief, when, when rocky times come, when hard times come, the first thing the congregation starts doing is, who do you think ought to be on our, our search committee? And the f first thing the pastor starts doing is sending out resumes. That's, that's not the way this should work. It shouldn't work that way at all. I am of the rare belief. Most do not share my, my view on this, but um, there are some that do. Long pastorates are better for the church and the pastor. Long pastorates. The average tenure in the Southern Baptist Convention a few years ago was two and a half years. It's down to 18 months now. I think success in this relationship is demonstrated like in a marriage. A marriage that celebrates its first anniversary is not necessarily a success. It's been one year. Most of that year has been the honeymoon, right? Two years doesn't necessarily make it a success. A 10-year marriage doesn't necessarily make, make it a success. Time does not make a marriage success. So 50 years doesn't do it. What tells you if a marriage was a success? When you get to the end of one of them's life, and you look back, and they were still striving together, still working together, still sacrificing for one another, still loving one another, still seeking to glorify God through the marriage. That's when you can say that marriage was a success. I think that's the same with the pastor congregation. It's not time. It's when whatever, for whatever reason, brings about the end of the relationship, you can look back and say, until the end, they loved each other. They served one another. They sought to honor God together. That's what makes a successful pastorate and congregation relationship. That is, the, that is the relationship Paul is talking about here. Now, I want to admit something before continuing. After pastoring, after preaching for nearly 16 years now, I've only had one topic that I struggle with preaching. This one. <laughs> I have a hard time preaching through something like this, preaching through a, a passage like this. So I want to be very clear when we start. I, I don't want to come across like I am saying that there's a problem with our relationship. You know this text was next, right? 
You, you know we, we just finished verse 11 last week, and so verse 12 comes next, right? So I did not pick this out saying, oh, there's a problem here, and we've got to address it. I don't think there's a problem. I don't want you thinking that I am standing here saying, well, you're not doing your part. Mm -mm, no, th this was the next text, folks. Th this, <laughs> this was the next text. Let me say very clearly right up front, I absolutely love pastoring Agape Baptist Church. It is a great honor and a great privilege to serve you as pastor. I am grateful for my fellow elders, Jay Johnson and Michael Peterson. I am grateful for the fact that I am not alone in this, that those men are with me in, in praying for you, with me in seeking to serve you. They are with me. You are upon their hearts and their minds. They are, their desire is to see God glorified through you and see you grow in Christ. I am grateful for their ministry. I, I so appreciate the ministry of our deacons, Doug and Jay, Frank, and now Michael Bradley. Uh, these men have a desire to see you grow in Christ. They're, they're so willing to give up time, um, pray for you, and, and seek your well, well-being. There's some other people I want to tell you I'm, who I'm, I'm grateful for and who you probably don't see. Sunday morning doesn't just happen. So many people just, they, they come to church and they come in and they sit in the pew. Folks, there's a lot that goes into Sunday morning. While you're not here, Kim is cleaning the church. We, we, we come in and sit in a clean church each week because Miss Kim goes through the church and cleans it. We are thankful for that. Doug and Mike sit in the back. You see them quite often, but uh, if it were not for them, we wouldn't have a video. We wouldn't have sound. Um, they take care of everything like that. We have Amy Peterson, who is preparing the music, put so much time and thought into the music that we use to lift up the name of Christ, to honor him. <laughs> you got Tony and Lisa and Ellie and Matthew on Sunday nights who take the time to sit there. Look, they've got to practice to play the piano. Playing the piano while people sing is not an easy thing to do, and yet they're here so that we can worship the Lord as well. You have doorkeepers week in and week out standing there opening the door, handing you bulletins. And those don't just print themselves. Miss Susan puts those together every week. There, there's, a, there's a list so long that uh, Susan does, we have no idea everything she does. She has to tell us everything she does. I'm telling you all that to tell you Sunday morning is not about me. And it's, I have the easy part on Sunday morning. They're the ones that put in the work for us to be here. I am grateful for them. This is not about me, it is about us working and serving together. I, I, I brought up those names because I, I want to make sure you're aware. There's a lot goes into this, and I don't do a lot of it. <laughs> I don't do most of it. A church is a group of people seeking to serve one another, sacrificing for one another so that God would be glorified through them. And I love pastoring this church and watching that take place, watching that happen. Let me mention one more group that I am thankful for because everything they do and everything I do would be, be kind of pointless if you didn't show up. I'm thankful for you as well. Your commitment to be here, your desire to learn from the Word of God, to grow and to serve Him. I've said all that to let you know I didn't pick this text because I think there's a problem. I do not think there is a problem in our relationship. I think we have a good relationship. That being said, 
text like this must be preached. As uncomfortable as I am in preaching it, they must be preached. Because we are human and sinful, and we tend to forget these things. And if we're going to continue to have a good relationship between the pastor and the, and the congregation, we've got to remember these things. Same goes for a marriage. It is when, when one or the other side, most of the time both sides quit working on the things they know must be done, that's when you start having problems in the marriage. And so since we are a group of sinners gathered here together, and we're prone to forget, it's good for us to go through a passage like this and be reminded that if we're going to build this relationship, the responsibility falls here. Not just me, that you were supposed to do that with me. Here. The responsibility to build this relationship is on us. And Paul gives us some things in these two verses that are sort of like an umbrella. This is not an exhaustive list, but it's sort of like an umbrella that if we will commit to these things, responsibilities that, they, that belong to the congregation, responsibilities that belong to the pastor, if we will commit to doing these things, if you will do the things you're responsible for, and me and the fellow, my fellow elders will do the things we are responsible for, then this relationship has an opportunity to continue to be good and grow even better. That is my desire. I pray and I hope that is your desire as well. And so let's jump in this morning. We will probably have only time to look at you this morning, which means I get to be uncomfortable for another week. But let's start by looking at the responsibilities of the congregation, okay? In verse 12 and 13, Paul lays this out, and, and, and he starts this and he lists several things Three things that uh, a church can apply to develop a better relationship between their pastor and, and themselves. You remember last week um, I shared with you how Paul mentioned in a caring way he dealt with an issue in the, the, Thessalon the, the church in Thessalon. Hmm. The church was struggling with. Um, they, they were struggling with the attitude. Uh, a lot of them were saying, well, Christ is coming, so I don't have to do anything. I don't have to work. I, I can just sit back. He'll be here soon. It's a, it was an issue that needed to be addressed. But since they are a good church and very few problems in the church, it, it didn't deserve a full-out rebuke. It didn't deserve a, a fist pounding and, and a very confrontational approach from him. And so instead of saying, you, 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 Paul said, but we including himself, just a general reminder that this is what we're to be about. I want you to notice how he continues, how he starts this section. But we request of you, brethren. This says a lot about the relationship between Thessalonica and Paul. It says a lot about the relationship of that church and him. He does not say now, I command you. Biblically, he had the support to. Th these are things that should be going about, should be true in the church, and we actually see these in a command form in other places. But he doesn't do that with this church. He says, but we request of you, brethren, I'm just asking that you do this. And it's almost a sense where you're, you see Paul is saying, because I know you're going to. I know you are, and I know you'll continue, and I know all I've got to do is remind you, brethren. Again, he's not elevating himself above them. He's not putting them on a platform, himself on a platform above them. He is equal with them, and so he simply says, we request of you, brethren. Three things that he requests of this church. The first Responsibility. The first thing he requests of the church in, in Thessalonica there, the first responsibility all churches have toward their leaders is appreciation. Verse 12, he says, But we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor 
among you. The King James says to know. We, we request that you know, and the ESV to respect or to give recognition to, I believe the Holman Christian Standard says. To know, to respect, to give recognition to, to appreciate, it, it means to have a knowledge about. It doesn't mean simply to know what they are like. It doesn't mean to know where they live or their phone number and their family. It comes from the Greek word that, that means to have a regard for, to cherish, to pay attention to. A congregation is to have a favorable opinion, a favorable attitude of their pastor. They should like them, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a personal like. It is a position. It is a recognition of the responsibility and the position that he has. Should have a respect for their pastor. To have affection for them, to have a deep, intimate knowledge, a deep, intimate relationship with their pastors. Listen, that helps us grow in sanctification. When we, when we know who the man is that is preaching to us and encouraging us to set aside sinful ways, and we see in him that when he is a sinner <laughs> that is setting aside his sinful ways, we get to know them in such a way we know the things they struggle with. We know the, the sins that they are confronted with, and we see in them. How, that's the kind of relationship we must develop with, the, the congregation must develop with their pastors, so they see them living like, living through these situations. It takes some time to develop that type of relationship. A church is to develop that, that type of affection, to, to recognize them as God's servants with God's given authority. Again, this, this type of appreciation demands invested time. It doesn't happen just on Sunday mornings. One of the reasons why it is so hard for a church and a, and a, congrega a, church and a pastor to develop, to develop a, a good, strong relationship is for some of us, this is the only time we see one another. For just an hour or so on Sunday morning. If that's going to be it, that means we need to do the most we can in that hour <laughs> um, to get to know one another. But it also sort of demands upon us to invest time outside of the church. To make time outside of the church to invest in one another's lives so we can get to know one another. It is important that we recognize them, that we come to know them. It's important that we recognize our congregation, recognize their pastors as God's men. Understanding that it was God who called them to the position, God who placed them in the position they're in. When, when, we, when a church calls a pastor, that is, that is what they're saying in the vote. I do believe this is the man that God is leading here. And so it's a recognition of God's provision, God's placing the man in that position. Jesus uh, in, in, informs us of this sort of attitude that a, a congregation should have toward their leaders. In Matthew, when he's talking with his, he's selecting his 12 apostles, and he, he says in Matthew 10, 40, he says, He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. To receive means hospitality, to re receive in hospitality, to, to take up. What, he, what Jesus is saying is if they will be hospitable to you and they will listen to you, then that's a, that's a reflection that they will listen to me, that they will be hospitable to me. He also says that again in John 13, 20, when he says, truly, truly, I say to you, 
He who receives whomever I send receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. So he's, he's stating in the positive here, meaning that if you will take possession, if they will take possession of you, if they will listen to what you have to say, if they will listen to your leading, and I sent you, they are listening to me. They are receiving my words. But he also states it in the negative. In Luke 10, 16, he says, the one who listens to you listens to me, and the one who rejects you rejects me. He who rejects me rejects the one who sent me. Those who reject Christ's messengers, those who reject the leaders in the church are not just rejecting the leaders in the church, they are rejecting Christ. Now, I know what you're saying, I know what you're thinking, but uh, keep in mind, we haven't got to the responsibilities of the leader yet. This, this all works together, okay? Because not all leaders in the church should be there. So let's just keep in mind as we're going through this, we, we haven't got to those responsibilities yet. When Paul says that uh, he encourages them to have an appreciation for the, or to appreciate their leaders, he means for them to have a favorable opinion of them, to accept them as God's messengers, to know them in a personal way. Unfortunately, I shared with you as we started this, this is not the norm in the church today. Many pastors are disrespected. They're dishonored by those who really don't know them. Um, but, the, but the role of the congregation is to appreciate the pastor, to recognize him, to know him. Paul says to give this appreciation is not just in knowing them, though. He says to give recognition to those who labor among you and lead you in the Lord. There's the key. To appreciate or give recognition to those who labor among you and lead you in the Lord. It is those who are faithfully doing the work. It has nothing to do with their likability. It has nothing to do with their charm, nothing to do with their appearance. It has everything to do with the work that they are doing, the role that they are fulfilling. A person that thinks a little of their pastor, if he labors for them, thinks little of their never dying soul. Because that is the charge that he has for. This appreciation Paul refers to here also speaks, uh, speaks of supporting the pastor financially. This is not a plea from Mike for a raise, okay? Just pointing out what the text in, in includes here. Paul says in 1 Timothy 5, 17, the elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. I, I want to point out just for my own sake there, uh, again, work hard. Those who labor among you and lead you, and then here again in 1 Timothy, those who work hard. Those are the ones that the church is to appreciate, those who work hard, who are laboring for their souls. One way of demonstrating appreciation for a pastor, Paul is saying, is to financially support them. He says that those leaders, those who work hard at preaching and teaching, are worthy of a double honor there to be greatly honored and highly appreciated by the congregation. Again, not a plea for a raise. The second thing, a second responsibility the congregation has is to esteem their leaders. Verse 13, he goes on and says, and that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Here the word esteem uh, means regard. It's closely related to the word appreciate, but, but it takes what has already been said about giving appreciation to and and gives it a little deeper meaning, a, a little more force behind the meaning, a little more emphasis from what he is requesting. It means to 
consider them or to pay them ample respect. The Greek literally means beyond all measure. Appreciate them and greatly, highly, Paul says very highly esteem them in love. The word there we are very familiar with, agape, it's not an emotion, but it is a choice of the will. It is a sacrificial love, a, a sacrificial giving of ourselves. And so the congregation is to be sacrificially giving of themselves to those who lead them, those who rule well, those who labor, those who work. Hold them up in great respect and great honor. And again, here Paul said it, not because of the person that they are, it's not based on their personality. It's not based on their charm. It's not based on their, their skills or anything like that, but simply because of their work. In love because of their work. That's how Paul finishes that statement. This is the respect, the, the regard that is to be given to our spiritual leaders, again, is not because of anything in them. It is because of the work that they are doing. They are engaging in working for eternal matters. They are working. Their, their concern is the never-dying souls of the people that they are in charge of. Your standing before a holy God is my focus and my concern, my fellow elders' focus and concern. Leading you to honor God, leading you to know God better, leading you to serve God better is my focus. That is the work that Paul is getting at here. The respect that is to be shown to the leaders is because of the work that they do. So congregations are to highly esteem their leaders because of the work they do. They are to regard, respect them but a final thing, a final responsibility the congregation is to have is to be at peace with one another. Look at verse 13, he says, live in peace with one another. Fighting in the church is a great cause of stress on the church and the pastor. I've been a part of church with, a, with fractions in it. I'm sure you have too. There's no joy in going to church on a Sunday morning when a church is like that, is there? There is, there is just absolutely no joy on Sunday morning going to a church where there is stress and division. Church members need to be at peace with one another. But I don't think that's what Paul is simply getting at here. The context is the relationship between the pastor and the congregation. He seems to be saying, be at peace with one another. The pastor and the congregation need to be at peace with one another. Why would this be an issue? Why, why would Paul have to say this to the church in Thessalonica? Why would he have to encourage them to be at peace with, with those who are leading them? Well, the church in Thessalonica is very young maybe less than a year old. All of the believers in this church, the members as well as those who are serving in leadership positions have been believers roughly about the same amount of time. There are no real elders in the faith here. The majority of these came to faith around the same time. Paul's practice when he started the church was to, after he started the church, got it going, was to find some men who were demonstrating leadership abilities, leadership characteristics, the qualifications set forth in 1 Timothy and Titus, right? He began looking for those, and then he would begin working with them to help them grow into leadership. When he left, he would appoint them as elders. Paul was run out of Thessalonica before he could do that. Notice Paul does not call them leaders or elders or anything in this passage. He just says, we request you that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you. He, again, he doesn't call them le elders or leaders. 
But these individuals were fulfilling those roles. Somebody had to take on that relationship, that responsibility. And so it's pretty likely that the church had a hard time appreciating and esteeming their fellow believers as leaders when they understood you've been a believer no much no longer than I have. <laughs> In fact, some of them may have been a believer a week or two longer than some of those leading them. Yet Paul has witnessed something in their life. That's why they're fulfilling these roles. And so he's encouraging them to submit to them. That's what this requires. It requires some submission. And that is what we're seeing here. We're, we're seeing that the church and the congregation, to, the, the congregation and the pastor be at peace with one another. There, there are some of you that have been believers longer than I have. You've studied the Word of God much longer than I have. But we come to understand that God has placed us both in the position and in the role we're in. And so our respect and our, and our attitude toward one another is not necessarily just the person, but what God has done and where God has put each individual. And so instead of striving against one another, instead of striving with one another and contending with one another, what Paul is asking the, the church in Thessalonica to do is to simply submit, to, to be at peace with one another. We find this same encouragement uh, where Paul is exhorting the church here in Thessalonica to appreciate, to, uh, to give, I mean, to esteem and to be at peace with. We find this same sort of thing in Hebrews when the writer of Hebrews says in 13.7, remember those who lead you who spoke the word of God to you and cons considering the result of their conduct, imitate their faith. The writer of Hebrews is telling them to have affection for, to keep in mind, to remember those who are leading them. And then he goes on 10 verses later and says, obey your leaders and submit to them because for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. Paul and the writer in Hebrews is encouraging the church to submit to their leaders, submit to those who are in leadership roles so that they can do it in a sense of joy and not strife for the benefit of the church. He says, so it would, so it will be unpro it would be unprofitable for you if they're in grief. Congregations, vital part of the life of the church, a vital part of what Christ is using to build the church. This relationship is a vital part of what he is doing. The responsibility given to, to congregations is to appreciate, to esteem, and to live in peace with their leaders. Next week, we're going to turn the focus and we'll look behind the pulpit. Again, remember, all these work together. There, there are some men that we look at and we think, no, uh-uh. Not this man, not that man in the pulpit. I understand what you're thinking. So we've got to keep in mind all of these work together. Okay? This is not a blanket statement. I tried to point that out with when he was talking about their work and their labor. But I want to encourage you with something. And again, please hear me. <laughs> I don't think there's an issue. I think we have a good relationship. But just as Paul keeps, keeps encouraging this church to excel still more, let's do that, right? Let, let's excel still more. It's good. Let's make sure it continues to get, be good and, and gets better. So let me encourage you something this week. Don't look ahead at, at my responsibilities. Focus on those for the congregation this week. Be praying about those things. Have the Lord search your heart. Are you submitting to these things? 
I can't do this side for you. This is all on you. Your, your fellow believers sitting in the pew beside you or in front of you, they can't do it for you. This is your responsibility. So let me encourage you as we're closing this morning. Look at these. Spend some time in these two verses. Are you fulfilling these responsibilities? Not for me, folks. Not for me, but for the glory of God. Are you doing it that he may be exalted, that the world may see us and exalt him because of our relationship? Let's have a word of prayer. Father, I want to uh, start by thanking you. I thank you, Lord, for bringing us together, Agape and myself. I thank you, Father God, for uniting us. Father God, for the simple fact that you are willing to use us as you seek to build the church. Father, I thank you for each one of these souls that are here. I thank you for the love, the respect, the appreciation, the, the support um, emotionally, spiritually, financially that they give me. Um, I thank you for the love that they demonstrate, the elders and the, the, the leaders here. Uh, Father, I pray that it would, it would grow. It's good. I pray that it would be better. Uh, Father God, in a year, we'll continue to pray that it'll be better and continue to grow because we desire to bring honor and glory to the name of Christ. We desire to be a, an example in our community. We desire to have people look at us and not see us, but see you. And so, Father, I pray that you encourage their hearts. And again, I thank you so much for each one of them. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.